out this uh, fine evening. Pretty good weather for December, I would say. I want to welcome you to the Joplin Seventh day Adventist Church for our Christmas Vespers. Um, I would guess we would call you annual since we do it most every year. Um, I want to open by reading a passage from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. And it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with the just justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's bow our heads as we begin. Dear God, thank you for the blessing it is to be able to come here and uh, sing praises and worship. Uh, please uh, bless everyone that is here tonight and that is partaking and participating in this uh, service and um, help us to all uh, gain a blessing. Amen. Amen. Uh, please join us now in singing Angels We Have Heard on High. The words will be on the screen, or you can turn in your hymn books to 142. Let's all stand as we start the program. Angels, we have heard on high.
Happy Sabbath, everybody. Our next reading is coming from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. The Bible says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Oh, 
Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 1, verse 16, and then 21 to 25. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. And then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Emmanuel, just remain seated. It's in 115.
Good evening, church. Good evening. I'm going to be reading out of Matthew 2, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod, Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is, it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of these shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them. Thank you, Neil. I really didn't think I needed that. <laughs> then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the, the, heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasuries, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh.
This Christmas season is the time of the year when everyone is thinking about giving. Whether you're a Christian or you're a non-Christian, we're thinking about giving, usually to our family members or our friends. But no matter what, we have an opportunity to be a blessing to those who are not as fortunate as we are. Um, I'm going to, the scriptures are of course from God's word, but I'm going to read them from my favorite chapter out of the Ministry of Healing. Do give and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is king, and he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. That's from Luke 6.35. Proverbs 28.27. He that hideth his eyes shall have many curses, but he that giveth unto the poor shall lack nothing. Luke 6.38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give in to your bosom. Verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, 
unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. O little town of Bethlehem, page 135.
I bet you're glad you came tonight. Amen. What a wonderful bunch of talent we have in this small group. How precious it is to have all those talents used in lifting up the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, ever since I was a boy growing up in Michigan, I always had Christmas as my favorite holiday. And, you know, I loved everything about it. I loved that it was snowy. I, you know, in Michigan, it was always snowy, you know. And uh, I, I loved that my mom made the house all decorated. And, and I loved that she put me in charge of, like there were, was this patio that we had out, that went out to the backyard, and there were these big glass doors. And she would have me take these little sticky decorations. It might be a, a Christmas tree or a snowman or a present or a deer or something. And, and I'd put them all over, and that was my job, to decorate the, those things like that. I, anyways, Christmas was such a special time to me. And I loved it when mom said, okay, it's time for you to put together your Christmas list. And I just felt like, oh boy, you know, oh boy. And I was so excited about putting together a Christmas list, a list of things that I could know that at least something on my list I would get as a present. She would always say, you, you're not going to get everything that you put on the list, but I'll at least get you something from your list, right? Well, later on, as I grew up and became a dad, my children began giving me their lists. And I often would say the same thing to them, you know, I... I probably won't be able to get you everything on your list, but at least I'll know what you are looking for or hoping for, and I'll try to get you something from your list. Then I would also ask my wife, could you put together a list so that at least I know I got you one thing that you like? You know, so she would, and I'd say, don't just put one thing on the list. Put, like seven, so you don't know what I'm going to get you. <laughs> and now as I continue on, I wonder, what would God put on his Christmas list to me? What would God want from me this Christmas? I love children. <laughs> Did you say maybe love? Yeah. That's a fantastic answer. That is just a fantastic answer. Amen. All right. Um, I want to share with you a few things from Scripture that um, it does demonstrate what God wants. And one of them I'm going to start out with is it seems an unlikely place to begin in a Christmas program. But I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. If you know this psalm, you know that it is the psalm of confession where David was, was praying after his, his great sin and setting up um, Uriah to be killed so he could take Bathsheba as his own wife, right? So now in Psalm 51, he's having his prayer of confession. And in that prayer, I'm not going to cite it all, but I want to point out something. In biblical times, when you offer something to God, you are offering a sacrifice, right? So sacrifices were being offered to God. That's how, you, how people would give to God, as it were. And in verse 17 of Psalm 51, it says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, <clears throat> a broken and contrite heart. 
These, O oh God, you will not despise. Amen. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. What, what does a contrite heart mean? Sorrowful, apologetic, remorseful, repentant. That's what this means. As you are thinking of offering something to God, what could I give God? What would be on God's Christmas list? He would like you to surrender yourself entirely. He would like you to confess your sins. He would like you to repent of your wickedness. Right? Yes. <laughs> now, I have a, a few more things that I'd like to share. In Hebrews chapter 13, there's another thing that God lists. So Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, all right. I'm going to read verses 15 and 16. And it says... Therefore, by him, that is Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. What does God want? He, he wants us to acknowledge where the good things in our lives come from. Because we know that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, right? So, and then notice in verse 16, it, it, it goes on and it says, but do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. God is happy when you share and when you give. And he wants you to give him thanks and praise for what he has done for you. He wants you to be mindful of him and the blessings that he brought to your life. These are things that are on God's list. I, I want to also uh, look at a scripture in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and I know most can quote it. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, what is it? Keep my, keep my commandments. Do you think God would like you to keep his covenant? Yes. This is clear. This is on his list. Keep my commandments. I also want to emphasize that with 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, it is regarding something that is being said to King Saul. And we're going to read just verse 22. And Samuel the prophet is addressing King Saul. And he says... It, well, in verse 22, it says, So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Now, let me pause for just a moment. You remember that Saul was instructed to kill everything. Everything. But he kept some of the best stuff, including livestock. And when the prophet was coming toward this scene, he could hear the animals. And then he says, he confronts Saul about it. And Saul is like, well, I thought I'd keep some to give him a sacrifice. And then Samuel says, 
Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? And to heed than the fat of rams? Oh, excuse me, I, I missed a, a line. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Amen. And to heed than the fat of rams. To obey is better than sacrifice. We've just been talking about when we offer something to God, like the sacrifice of praise. It, it is a sacrifice. Um, he, and the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart, right? And, and now he's saying to obey is better than sacrifice. If you love me, keep my commandments. What does God want for Christmas? He wants me to do what he says. He wants me to follow his commands. And he wants you to. Now let's look back in Hebrews at chapter 11. It's the faith chapter. You know, there's more than a few things because it's his Christmas list, right? All right. So um, we're going to chapter 11 here. And I want to look at verse 6. And it says, but without faith, it is what? Impossible. Impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So God wants you to have faith in him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, right? Yeah. So <laughs> we must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who believe in him. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Man, I like you up there. Verse, uh, excuse me, now we're going to go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, and I have just a couple more verses to share with you. John chapter 17 is where Jesus is praying a special prayer. And church, family, I, I know that we have talked about this on, on numerous occasions. I want to point out again, though, this section in John 17 where Jesus is praying for you and me. And in verse 20, it starts out and it says, well, first of all, let me just say this. He, first, he prayed for his mission. Then he prayed for his disciples who were with him. And now we're picking up in verse 20 and he says, I do not pray for these alone, meaning the disciples he just prayed for but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which is who? Ding, ding, ding. Us. It is us. This, he's praying for us, and he says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one, just as we are one. Yeah. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Amen. So Jesus is praying that we will all be one in communion with God and in unity with one another. Amen? Amen? What does he want for Christmas? What does he want for He wants us to come together. He want, and it seems so hard. It, we have so many obstacles in our mind these days because of all the things about, you know, social distancing. We're even trying to respect that tonight. You see that our, our, uh, our rows are distanced apart and and we have our signs up encouraging people to remain at a distance, yet here we are, gathered together in one place, lifting up one name, Jesus. Amen. And we are experiencing a unity 
as we are coming together in God. We are indeed actually answering a prayer of Jesus tonight. Now, two, two last points. I'd like you to turn with me to Romans. The book of Romans, chapter 12. I'm just going to read verse 1. This is an important verse. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. What does God want for Christmas? Strange as it may sound to say it this way, God wants your body. He wants, why, why, why would I say that? Because why would he say that? Everything that you are, everything that is you is contained in your body. Yes. And God wants all of you. Yes. And so if you present him your body as a now, most of the time, when you talk about sacrifices, you think of something being killed, right? But God is saying he wants your body as a living sacrifice. And again, it just it emphasizes the, the point that I sometimes like to make about, if, you know, if you would choose, if it came down to it, you would die for him. How much more than does God want you to live for him? Yes. Right? So... What does God want for Christmas? He wants your body. And then lastly, and this is the first thing that my little friend up there cited. God wants love. He does. He wants you to love him. And it's interesting how he points that out. I, I want to point something out in, in uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13 and verse 34. And it says, Jesus is speaking, by the way, and he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Does it sound like Jesus wants this? Yes. And then my last point on this whole thing of, of love and how it fits in the way that God addresses it is Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And verse 40. And Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking about a king, and he says, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The way that you treat the least of the people you know is how you treat Jesus. When you're impatient, when someone is getting on your nerves, when someone wants your time and you don't have the time, the people who aren't getting close to the top of your list, the way that you treat them is the way that you treat Jesus. And what did he say that he wanted you to do with them? He wanted you to love them. And why did he call it a new commandment? It wasn't a new commandment to love somebody else. He called it a new commandment because he showed you what that kind of love looks like. When he washed the feet of Judas, his own betrayer. 
when he prayed for the people who put the nails in his hands and feet. He showed us what that kind of love looks like. I want to have this last statement to you. What does God want for Christmas? A broken and contrite heart. Praise and thanksgiving. Obedience. Faith. Communion with him and unity with the brethren. You, your body. And love. And the way that you love others is the way that you love him. God's Christmas list, at least part of it. Let's pray together, shall we? Tonight, Lord, as we have considered your word, it's from a different perspective with us thinking about what you would like from us. We are so thankful for the unspeakable, priceless gift of Jesus to come and intervene on our behalf. It is impossible for us to recognize what great sacrifice has been made on our behalf. But we are thankful and we want to give you some things that you want off your Christmas list. Please help us to remember these things and to act in accordance with what you want from us, that our lives may be pleasing in your sight, Lord. We want to give you the gift of ourselves. And we want to give you the gift of a broken and contrite spirit as we learn how to love each other. Please bless us to this end in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Through 20. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to the God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into the heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them.
as we sing our last song together, if you'll get your candle ready. I'm going to come to the end of the middle aisle for each person, and if we'll light your candle, and then you can light the next person candle. candle. <laughs> the way that we do that is the lighted candle stays upright, and the candle being lighted is tilted to be lit. And Steve, if you would get our our lights. Steve, if you would shut off our lights, please. As we sit here together this evening, I pray that you will share your light as you go out this evening after we're done singing. Find a way to touch someone else's life and share Christ's light that he has put in each and one of us. To show love, compassion, and empathy to others. Join me as we sing our closing song, Silent Night.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for this time this evening, reminding us how near you really are to us and how you came to this earth with us in mind. Even if it had just been one of us, you would have came. I pray, Lord, that we will carry that thought, knowing how special each one of us is to you. And to know that we, Lord, despite all the other things, that, Lord, you've forgiven us and that you give us new life, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen.